Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting. Paid for by Jerry's own 6th District Congressional Club and open to anyone who wanted to attend, Dialogue with Litton will become the place to be. In the years that followed, Americans had many questions and wondered answers about the possible impeachment of their president, a food crisis, farm crisis, energy crisis, inflation, the Vietnam War, and the country's place in a changing world. And when Watergate happened, I think that just piled on to a lot of the negative feelings that people had. Then, uh, then Jerry Litton came along and uh, uh, he was bringing people in from Washington who were at the seat of all of this that was going on. And they were talking about Watergate and they were talking about the things in the whole political sphere of the nation's capital at the time. And people were able to get through his program uh, a glimpse of some of the movers and shakers and opinion makers and the people who were at political ground zero in those days. Uh, there's some people, and I disagree with them, who say that um, the impeachment or resignation of uh, President Nixon would would uh, put our country into a tailspin. Well, I, I can't go along with that. We, we This country is stronger than any one president. Uh, personally, I don't think the president's going to resign. He's told me straight face that he was not going to resign. I don't think he is. I don't think he should. I think the, I don't think resignation would uh, would solve this thing. I think what we need more than anything else is to get the honest facts on the table and then make a decision and, and the country will, will back the Congress up if it makes the right decision. And, and I don't think this country is going to fall whether we elect a Democratic Congress or a Republican Congress or whether we keep Nixon in or we kick Nixon out. I, I think this country is a lot stronger than any one president. I went to their school in McLean, Virginia, where they live. They live, and um, that same phenomenon that took place. The first question was, uh, should we impeach the president? And I'll tell you what was terrifying was that there was cheering. And that was really scary. And we had to then talk and defend uh, the presidency. And I might say this, that when we voted, and if you watched that and heard that, that was a tough time. And when we left that room after we voted, we walked off to the back, and we looked at one another, we didn't have to say anything, because we knew. We knew what it meant. We knew what it meant to this country. So all at once, you have very high input costs, you have high consumer prices, you have no grain reserve, so that little cushion of stability was gone, and you had this sense of maybe we can export our way to prosperity. So when the expansion of agriculture, particularly with the grains, uh, wheat, uh, soybeans and corn was proposed into Eastern European countries, there was a lot of a lot of doubting people that we should do that. Jerry felt, you know, they're, uh, if they've got money to pay for something, then we ought to do business with them. And uh, his philosophy there was that it would improve our relationship with them because everybody liked to eat. Because we hear a little rumor out here in the country, way goes the prices. And for saying we know we hear another rumor, they go this way. I think what we need is is a some kind of a system, a reporting system, to protect uh, our grain market uh, from a major buyer such as Russia coming in here and disrupting it to the extent that they have in years past. We never really know what their intention is, whether their intention is to get grain for their people or whether their intention is to disrupt, disrupt our market. And I certainly do not in, in, uh, support embargoes of exports until we can find something else that we produce that we can sell. 
that will keep this country in the black. One of the complicating factors in agriculture is that farmers, unlike virtually anybody else in, in the economy, are price takers. It's not like producing a, a picture frame and you say, well, this is my price, take it or leave it. And if no one takes it, you just set it in your closet and you could wait for five years, ten years. You can't do that with food. Food is a perishable product. Food is also a necessity. On the fourth day of the debate on the Farm Bill, I think the, one of the most disturbing things that ever really happened that I've seen in Congress, we had some demonstrators in the galleries that day before the police threw them out. These were some consumer groups from Washington, and the banners they were waving in the halls of Congress said, milk is for children, not for profit. And the thought came to my mind, uh, if the American people feel that the farmers of this country are expected to produce food at no profit, we really have a problem. Uh, and of course, if there's not any profit in it, we'll have to turn to the government to do it, and they can't even pack the mail, let alone farm. I wonder if we'd be unreasonable if we ask the administration to give us access to world markets without any interference. No, sir, you wouldn't be unreasonable. As a matter of fact, you'd be very reasonable. And, uh, and fr I wish you'd make that noise very loudly, as a matter of fact. We've got a battle within, within government in Washington for this. There are many members of the House of Representatives where Jerry Litton sits that, uh, <coughs> that pressures for export controls because they represent urban constituencies. And somehow they feel that if we just didn't ship this stuff abroad, we'd have a lower price at the grocery store. Now, I don't buy that myself. You're an agricultural state, but I'll bet you a cookie that the great majority of your legislators down there don't have, some wouldn't even recognize the working end of a cow, would they, Jerry? <laughs> some of them don't know the difference between a bull and a cow, too, I think. <laughs> well, there's some of them, all they got is bull. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry later went on to form the Ag Council of America, which uh, was the first effort uh, in agriculture to bring everybody together. So the Farm Bureau didn't get along with the National Grains, who didn't get along with the NFO. And so just to have all those people in one room was a giant step forward in, in agriculture, in my opinion. But the place was packed, literally packed. And the first time I've ever seen all the farm organizations together at one meeting. And there was not only the farm organizations, uh, Missouri farmers were there, as I recollect, and the NFO, the Farm Bureau, the Farmers Union, all of the farm organizations, and the agribusiness community, and we had a ball. And uh, Jerry Litton invited me in, which I enjoyed. I like large audiences, you know, and, I, and uh, we had a really, I think, one of the best things we have done on, for agriculture, Jerry. We had a hundred congressmen at the head table that day. I haven't seen that many congressmen together since the pay raise vote. <laughs> It became very obvious in the first year that uh, this was a media event in addition to a constituent event. The thought was, and I don't remember exactly how it all, I'm sure it was Jerry's idea, uh, to see if there was a possibility of turning it into a program. They would run a, an audio tape uh, off of the sound feed, and that audio tape would then be taken to the congressional office immediately after the meeting and uh, would be uh, sent via the telephone wire to the Washington, D.C. office where they had a recording machine on that end. Mm -hmm. And by the time the congressman and I re returned to Washington at 6.30, 7 o'clock, we'd go by the congressional office and pick up the transcript and uh, take that cassette tape back to his house. And for the next four to five hours, we reduced that 90-minute uh, tape into a 27-minute uh, uh, program. It, it was so interesting because this doesn't sound like a big deal today. But 35 years ago, this was indeed a big deal. I mean, average people just didn't know how to do all of this like people do today. And people didn't have equipment in their houses like uh, recording <laughs> like recording equipment like, like uh, Ed has just described. And uh, no one was used to being at a meeting, you know, the, where there were cameras and, and lights and cords, you know, were, were all over the floor. And, you know, we were always walking over the cords. And I remember thinking not much about it. Because I had just gotten out of college, and I just thought it was all great. But uh, I remember the older people, the older professional staffers on the Hill in our office. They, they just almost didn't understand what this was all about until about three or four times into it. And then they, they, were, they, were, they were pretty taken and pretty, pretty awestruck about, 
what was happening. And I'd like to ask Ms. Chisholm what she thinks the future is for the women in politics. Oh, I think the future is a beautiful one. <laughs> I think that we have to recognize that in our nation, we have a tendency to become too hung up on sex physically, psychologically, and emotionally. <laughs> There's no psychological test yet, my dear lady, that indicates that either one of the two sexes have a superiority over the other one in terms of gray brain matter. But what we need to do is that the bright men and the bright women in this nation need to help to put our country together. And don't be afraid to recognize it. They're stupid men and they're stupid women, they're brilliant men, and they're brilliant women. Uh, I'd like to have you and Mrs. Litton speak to the issue of the Equal Rights Amendment. I'll let my wife speak to that first. <laughs> well, my husband, I would say, has always been uh, a believer in equal rights because uh, in all the time that we've worked together on the ranch and in our politics, why, he's always given me a free hand to do what I thought was best. And uh, I think that uh, this is very important to a woman with, if they're married and don't have a career, if they have the ability or the opportunity to uh, do what they want to do, what will make them happy. And I appreciate that. I, I've been a supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment all along. And uh, simply feel that we've come for 200 years and we've been talking about the rights of people and talking about the equal rights of blacks versus whites, the rights of various people in various parts of the country. And here we are, 200 years, and we still have a second-class citizenship for women. And that doesn't make any sense at all. I don't think there is any doubt that Dialogue with Lytton had a very positive impact on the congressman's career. Uh, how could it not? I mean, it was being shown, you know, as Ed said, started out with a couple stations, and uh, by the end, it was on uh, 10 television stations. So this was shown as a public service program throughout the state of Missouri. And so month after month, for a couple years prior to him running for the Senate, uh, families and households and voters throughout the state of Missouri were getting to really be comfortable with him, getting to know him, and uh, really getting to like him. And I think to a great degree, that's why a two-term congressman uh, did what he did in terms of uh, coming in first in a primary election against two much more experienced, uh, longtime family names in the state of Missouri. It was a listening post for him. Uh, people felt like that they had some degree of ownership of what was happening uh, back east. Uh, it wasn't just some abstract... Uh, organization back there that was governing them that they had no direct contact with. They had direct contact with the leaders of the, uh, the democratic world in, in our country. Getting control of the federal, federal budget is the number one issue as far as I'm concerned in solving this terrible problem of inflation and the cost of living. And I would like both you gentlemen to comment on deficit spending, would you reduce it? Well, I personally uh, think we've all got to cut back. I'm for balancing the budget uh, as a help in the fight on inflation. I would make this qualification. If we're going to cut, we're going to cut across the board. Everybody's going to share the cuts, and it's going to include the defense budget. You know, we had uh, 500,000 people in Vietnam. Bring them all home. We settle our problems with China, and a lot of the military was for that. We settle, we had detente with the Russians. I'm a taxpayer, I look at the defense budget and say, gee, this is great generation of peace. I wonder how much the defense budget is down. It isn't down, it's up. It costs more in a generation of peace than it cost when we had the Cold War on. So I think we can balance the budget, but I think cuts of fat ought to come out of the defense budget just as well as health and education and daycare centers and a lot of other things. <laughs> Let's take a look at uh, uh, what, the, what is the cause of the deficit. Now, many people say, well, it's nothing more or less than these wild-eyed congressmen trying to spend. Now, most congressmen are not that wild-eyed. Uh, I'm a kind of a tight fellow with a buck. If you don't believe it, go out to lunch with me sometime. <laughs> or, uh, uh, and I, I really am. I was brought up in that kind of a home and debt to me uh, because I saw my father go through the misery of the Depression because I grew up in that time. It's a very bothersome thing to me. But every 1% of unemployment 
cost the federal treasury and the government through expenditures and loss of revenues a minimum of $16 billion. Now, if we reduce the unemployment down to 4% in this country, we'll have a balanced budget and a large governmental surplus. Our problem today is that America's not at work. One of the problems that people are concerned about is the fact that those things that we normally do to slow down inflation create a greater recession problem, and those things we normally do to solve a recession create a bigger inflation problem, they don't see an answer to it. As a matter of fact, somebody said the other day, they're afraid that the light at the end of the tunnel the president sees is a train coming this way. And it's, it's, but it's not, it's not really very funny out around the countryside. I'll tell you, Congressman, if you write your own lines, I'd like some help. <laughs> Why, as a young man who's deeply concerned about the future of our country, why should I go out and, and vote for, for you, Mr. Carter? <laughs> Thank you. If I can't answer that question, I don't deserve to be president. <laughs> In the field of, um, of energy, which is going to be perhaps the most uh, important and divisive uh, new concept to present itself to the American people in the next 10 years, we have no energy policy. We need immediately to have a stop to the increase of imports of oil from other countries. And Ford says that if we get gasoline up to $5 a gallon, people will buy less. And uh, of course they will at that price, but you raise gasoline four or five cents a gallon, people don't, don't quit buying gasoline and you raise gasoline to the farmer, how high do you have to raise gasoline to the farmer before he parks his tractor and doesn't plant a crop? And if he does, what have we gain? You just can't use price as a mechanism for those things that are essential. But I do think that it's possible for us to pinpoint wasteful areas of petroleum products and non-essential areas where there is some kind of elasticity of demand where increased prices will discourage increased consumption. I think everybody agrees we've got to use less energy in this country if we're going to remove our dependence on these OPEC countries. And energy is so crucial to us that we can't leave ourselves that exposed. But now comes the president with a, with a program, and you may or may not agree with it, but at least he's got a program at long last. And the best thing that the majority in the Congress can think of is, let's delay it. I agree with him. I think we should delay it. <laughs> What the president has also done is he went to the automobile manufacturers uh, during December and he said, I'll give you a choice. Either you sign the dotted line and send me a letter and guarantee me that by 1979, all the cars produced in this country, in terms of a fleet mix average, will have 40% be better mileage. Or the choice is, I'll go and ask Congress to mandate you to do it. The years ahead, I believe we do have an energy crisis which can only be resolved by our quite thoroughly changing our American way of life and our outlook on things. As a matter of fact, we're doing a lot of investigation into uh, developing electrical energy out of wind. Uh, we have a report, a study now that's come out of a couple of engineers for Lockheed uh, Aircraft Company have shown us in a report, and I've read it, that if we built 50, 54,000 windmills across this country, that by, the, in, by 1995, that's 20 years from now, we could supply one-fifth of all of the total electrical energy that we need just from wind. So that's what I'm saying. We're looking at these alternate energy sources. Now, to be sure, the wind's not going to blow all the time. So what do you do when the wind's not blowing? That's when you have some nuclear power plants provide that input when the wind's not blowing. You have solar energy to provide solar energy when the sun's shining and in those parts of the country that can utilize it. So we are working on these things. So 1973, 74, 75, your politics is changing in Missouri. It's changing because we have young, fresh-faced Republicans who are coming in versus the old uh, Democrats of, of the Hearns and Kirkpatrick and Eagleton era. So you contrast 
these young, fresh Republicans against the old line Democrats, and you could see that there was a chance to build some things at that time. And then along comes uh, this, this bright, charismatic, I mean, if there was anybody that the word charisma fit, it was Jerry Litton. And Jerry Litton comes along and becomes a congressman from Northwest Missouri. And I don't think that there is very much doubt in the minds of many people who were watching Jerry Litton that this was a guy who was on a track to the White House. What's your thinking on the aid that will come out of Washington for Cambodia, or if there will be any? If I thought that 200 million would save them, or 300 million, I'd vote for it. But I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that 200 million is going to save them, or 300 million, or be it 500 million. Now, we put $248 billion in Vietnam. That's how much of the taxpayers' money has been spent there, in addition to the human lives that have been lost, which is even more important. And at some point, you just have to draw a line and say enough is enough. When it was over, one of the senators who is known as a very liberal anti-Vietnam senator and has been almost from the beginning, said that the key single lesson that we must learn from Vietnam above everything else is that if we ever again commit American troops, we should decide before committing them that we're going to go in to win. And let me say this. We just can't be the policemen of the world. Now, we're concerned about these people. We are. <laughs> But if we lose our own economy, and it's in real trouble, if we lose that, then we've lost everything. And we must remember that. First of all, we don't think we're going to have a war. We think we'll be strong enough to stop it. But if we have one, and we have to be prepared for it, we think the first battle will be the key battle, as opposed to World War II, where the last battle was the key battle. Why is the first battle the most important? <laughs> well, uh, take a, take a Mideast war, the last Yom Kippur war. It was a war of very high lethality. By that, I mean that the Syrians and the Egyptians alone lost more tanks in 18 days than the United States has in Europe. Now, if you're going to have a war of extremely high lethality, no nation is rich enough. Just take financially. No nation is rich enough to continue more than about a couple of weeks. <laughs> By 1976, Dialogue with Lytton had grown to a live audience of 1,800 people and the program was aired to countless others on 12 television and 50 radio stations. Lytton had succeeded in bringing government to the people and felt he was now ready to run against two well-known Missouri Democrats for the Senate nomination. We were really nervous through the whole campaign and working very hard because we had an uphill road to climb, as you know running against uh, former Governor Hearns and against Congressman Symington, the son of retiring Senator Symington. And I always remember, um, I was at headquarters the night of the election. Mm, I was and um, the phone rang, and it was Jerry. Jerry, and they were leaving the Chillicothe Airport. Um, and he wanted to know if our early spotters from around the state had called in. And when I gave him the numbers... Uh, I yelled around for somebody, and they brought the numbers to me. When I yelled around, I remember he said, we're not just going to win, we're going to win big. Mm -hmm. And they, they were at the airport in Chillicothe, so they, you know, they got, so he said, he said, I'll hour. see you in a half hour. And uh, got, on, got on the plane, and then the rest is, you know, sadly, yes. history. On the evening of the primary election, Congressman Jerry Litton, his wife Sharon, and their two children, Linda and Scott, boarded a plane in Chillicothe to head for Kansas City and await official election results. They would never arrive. The left engine failed and the plane crashed just off the end of the runway, killing pilot Paul Rupp Jr. and his son, along with Jerry and his family. Lytton's supporters had shared his vision and applauded his work in making government more accessible to the people. His untimely death left a void in all their hearts. What signs are there that the world is avoiding the conflicts that have plagued us through history and started to work together as a unit? Them's the kind of questions that hurt politics. <laughs> Inflation. 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 Women in politics. Gun control. 
from a recession? Depression, recession, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> Balancing the budget. On the deficit. The staggering deficit. Deficit. We can't continue to spend more than we make, to buy more than we sell, to consume more than we produce. And that's what we've been doing as a country. But let's not try to make the cuts right now while we're trying to pull up out of this recession. Campaign finance law. Campaign financing reform. <clears throat> Social security. Deregulation. Agriculture. Target prices. A federal grain reserve. Fertilizer prices. The food cost. I don't mean to disappoint you, but as a peanut farmer from Georgia and as, a, as me as a congressman living in Washington, let me assure you that there's more nuts in Washington than Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> energy. It's energy in the, the energy crisis. Defense budget. Defense spending. A price of crude oil. The oil companies. To this oil company and that oil company. Oil companies. Affirmative action and equal rights. Do you can't expect these men overnight to really jump on the bandwagon and say there's a change. It's coming and they won't be able to stop it. It's coming. National health insurance. National health care. The National Health Insurance Program. Immigration. The immigration naturalization. Watergate. Impeachment problem. President Nixon is Union. unionized. I'm not blaming you, Jerry, but <laughs> Congress created 84 new agencies last year. It was an off, it was a bad year. It was an off year. <laughs> the unemployment. Unemployment. 10% unemployment. Transportation and commerce and housing. Welfare. And welfare. Welfare and the welfare system. We she has another question. I, I just yet. want to know if you have any ideas of how we could overcome this problem of sex between the men and the women. I think, I think first of all. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can have that one. I, I, <laughs> on school busing. Education. Well, education. High quality education. Electoral college. In Vietnam. In South Vietnam. Amnesty. Amnesty. The amnesty question. I think with the economic problems we have in this country, we've got to see leadership starting in Congress. Panama Canal. It's taxes. Taxes. State tax reform. Income tax. Tax cuts. Tax reform. We need to see people can live where they want to live, work where they want to work, go to school where they want to go to school, but to try to force people to go from here to there, I think is illogical. Former President Nixon has made his sojourn into China, and this has given uh, a lot of people a great deal of concern, and I think justifiably so. Is there any thinking along the line that something should be done to keep a resigned president from continuing to meddle in American foreign policy? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> now do we have any other questions? <laughs> We've run out of time, and the time has gone quickly again. I do want to thank everybody for being here and for meeting uh, as we have month after month after month for four years. We will have dialogue with Lytton again next month. And at that time, I'll either be a congressman on his way out or a senator on the way in. And I hope that you come, participate as you've done today, as you've done for the last four years. If you can't come, I hope that you tune in on television throughout the state of Missouri as we continue to bring government to the people. Thank you very much.